WWT presents Experts. Hello, everyone. It's Matthew Koble, host of WWT Experts. Uh, great to see you again, and we're delighted to have two experts with us today. And we'll t be talking about the world's most innovative service providers and how they're leveraging digital technologies to enhance customer experience and introduce new digital services that can help them monetize their networks. I'll be talking with Greg Shoney and Charlie Lawhorn about the rapid implementation of new ideas and the creation of efficient customer-centric platforms that are redefining the service provider industry. Uh, this is one of four episodes we've got in a series around the telecommunications industry in general and how service providers are thinking about artificial intelligence, business agility, security, and today's topic, digital. So with me, Greg Shoney is SVP of Services and Strategy Solutions in Worldwide Technologies Global Service Provider Business, and as such, Greg helps our clients in the industry with all aspects of their business and technology needs and decisions, but notably, you know, security, 5G, mobile edge computing, cloud automation, and of course, just general overall strategy work. Also here, uh, as a chief digital advisor at Worldwide Technology, we have Charlie Lawhorn, who works with our clients to blend together thoughtful design and digital technologies to drive strong business outcomes. In his career, Charlie's touched on strategy, sales, marketing, experience design, customer success, and worked really across a wide variety of industry verticals. You'll usually find Charlie talking with executives within our client organizations, and he's definitely a trusted speaker, both here at Worldwide and out around the industry. Of course, that's why we've got him here today. So, gentlemen, thanks for being here. Hey, Matt. Good to see you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. Ex excited to be back. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Good to see you again, Charlie. All right. Well, let's let's jump right in. So uh, first question. So how are digital capabilities just really transforming the service provider sector overall? Gosh, Greg, jump in and I'll, 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 I'll add. Yeah, it, it's an exciting time, Matt, for sure. And, and we are involved in a number of big engagements with uh, our largest customers across the telecom cable media space. But there are a few common themes. When we talk about digital, obviously such a broad term and it, it captures a lot. Um, when we think about the service provider industry, obviously one of the major outcomes to run the business is the ability to attract, retain subscribers, increase average revenue per unit, ARPU, as we like to talk about in the SP space. And when you think about digital, um, digital in the realm of helping to attract and retain customers, um, doing it um, online, doing it uh, offline, doing it with their retail locations, um, it's a very, very competitive environment out there. And so some of the things that we're helping our large SPs work around are how to accelerate customer adoption, um, how to increase customer delight, and you know, ultimately how to, how to retain customers and grow those relationships over time. So Charlie, obviously anything you'd add to that? There's a lot. I mean, the, the world of digital has really invaded the, the large service providers in so many ways. Greg touched on a handful, but you can think about it you know, in the retail experience, Matt, uh, pick your favorite telco store. They've built those out as experiential hubs to showcase all types of new technology, how they can bring security into the home, how they can help you with mobile devices. Um, they've also done some really amazing things with community outreach programs through those retail facilities. And a lot of that's underpinned by just digital technologies, helping through simplifying check-in all the way through check-out. Um, those things impact guest and uh, customer experience pretty quickly. On the other end, as Greg mentioned, you know, helping retain customers, it's thinking about digital in the contact center or in the different contact points that they have with their clients or with their customers. And as they do that, thinking through things like next, next best action or leveraging AI solutions to drive better automation, to, to reduce wait times or to try and offload things to chatbots and all the other fun things that we're seeing, not just to reduce costs, but to try and give a better guest experience, a better customer experience um, for, for helping retain those customers. 
Well, Charlie, I mean, I know from our time working together with clients, you know, digital disruption has really happened to everybody and has for years across all the industries. And I know that's, of course, affected service providers as well. I'm curious your point of view on how service providers are sort of dealing with the disruptions that happened to them, but also at taking advantage of it to advance their own business models and move forward in new effective ways. That's a, it's a big question. You're right. So, you know, let's start on how they've been disrupted. I mean, there's so many startups and, uh, you know, regional players and carriers. Uh, some of the largest cloud service providers have moved in and starting try, started to offer services that are similar to what had been classic service provider, you know, offerings in the past. So there's a lot of disruption in the space. Uh, but I, I look at what they're doing to disrupt back into the market, right? So a lot of our large service providers are thinking about um, offering uh, cloud services or GPU as a service as the world of AI invades the, the service providers. It's not just how can they use AI internally, but how can they use AI to help their, their customers and help their customers grow? So a lot of the service providers that we're working with matter thinking about new revenue streams or new enablement or assisted solutions to both get better customer service, but also to, to grow their, their footprint in their clients. So this disruption that's happening to them and, and, and that they're also you know, rapidly disrupted and back into the market is, is everywhere. It's, it's the telcos, it's the cable operators, it's the satellite companies. They're all, they're all becoming a, um, a hybrid set of companies underneath these umbrellas and offering lots of different new service lines. Yeah, Matt, I might add as well, you know, if you think about digital in the realm of what is possible, traditional service provider technologies and methodologies were, were run on big monolithic networks. And it was really a connectivity business and it became an entertainment business, a wireless business. Uh, but if you think about the way networks the underlying communication network that these service providers run are being architected today. They're much more agile. They're driven by software. Uh, they're nimble. And so uh, it, it offers an, an opportunity to transform then the types of services you're delivering to the residential consumer subscriber base, but as well as potentially your business services customers. The other thing that I think is, is interesting as well um, is on the business services side, right? Whether a, a telecom or a cable company has uh, a, an end customer that's a manufacturer or a retailer or um, any other industry, you know, this is a world that WWT participates in in a big way. So folks like Charlie and others bring that expertise to help figure out what, what's going to be the relevant set of solutions for those end business services customers. Mm -hmm. Well, Greg, a moment ago, Charlie mentioned the idea of kind of new revenue streams. So I'm curious, you know, how you are advising service provider clients to explore, you know, new digital revenue streams using their existing capabilities or even evolutions of those capabilities. Yes, yeah, so Matt, great question. And as Charlie, myself, the team, we're out talking to executives and, and all of our service provider customers. Really, it, it spans many areas from a service creation perspective. But a couple common themes, right? Like we talked about a moment ago, um, at attaching to new customers, but also maybe making services available to new customer segments that otherwise really they weren't targeting. So but Charlie, I know you, you're working on a number of specific engagements right now. And you know, anything you'd, you'd want to add to that? Yeah, I, I'll pick a, um, a very recent example with one of the large service providers. Our team came in and help them really think through how to drive monetization of some unused capacity on their network. Um, large player uh, nationwide, and they offer you know, hotspots to the home. We all have wireless access points in our home. And they realize that in a lot of large scale apartment or condo communities, um, you don't need a box in everyone's home. And so how could they allow non-subscribers to basically get a day pass? to access the services or a month pass to the services. So without having to bring new cabling in, new infrastructure in, ship hardware to the home, they realize they can provide millions of people with additional service 
um, without really having much impact on their network. All right? They already had the excess capacity there. So from a digital perspective, Matt, we help build out the front end applications. We help them do some things that they hadn't done before, bringing alternate payment types. I, I know, Matt, you know, we do a ton of work in food and restaurants. So we brought some of that thinking into the space. No, we're not selling food over the telco network. but. Apple Pay, Google Pay, some of those different alternate payment methods that your typical carrier doesn't normally accept, we brought those into the app so that the clients that they were, the guests and the, the, the customers that they wanted to serve could pay through a credit card or Apple Pay or Google Pay all through a captive portal and make it really simple and easy to renew these types of services. So that was a great example of where this customer had all of this excess capacity. We helped build a front end digital experience to give access to that capacity. And it drove multiple millions of new subscribers for them on a monthly basis. So it was a, it was a big win for them without a massive investment, but it was a digital front door that really allowed them to do that. Yeah. Oh, that's a great example, Charlie. I love that. And, you know, that sort of leads a little bit into my next question for, for you both, which is thinking about the significant investments that service providers have made over the years into their existing infrastructure, which they have to do. I mean, that's the business model. Uh, does that create challenges for them to embrace new digital approaches or how are they leveraging those existing infrastructures to have success with some of the new and emerging things we're seeing in digital? So go ahead. I'll jump. Yeah, I'll jump in on this one just first, Greg. Um, it, it's, a, it's a both ways answer on that one, Matt. Like they've got massive capacity. They've got great contact center technologies. They've got, you know, really pretty good omni-channel capabilities from in-store, online, those types of things. The challenge is it was, as Greg mentioned earlier, built fairly monolithic around certain network capabilities or certain coverages. So they're they're big, they're heavy. Um, sometimes their technology is a little bit outdated in some of the different aspects of their business, like any big organization. And what we're seeing them do is operate more through open APIs, building out different service layers that allow people to connect to these services easier. Um, thinking through this more modern technology stack, the software front end, Matt, is where they're spending a lot of time. Um, it allows them to play better with affiliates or partners. It allows them to open up new service lines or new revenue lines faster. So we're seeing them spend a lot of money on the software side of their business. Not that they're not also spending on the hardware side, but that making the software side easier to interact with, integrate better across their ecosystem is a, a, a large area of investment for, for many of the service providers. Yeah, that's a great point, Charlie. And I might add as well, uh, if you think historically, the, these networks that we run our lives on, uh, they gener generate an enormous amount of value, societal value for all of us. It's the service providers then obligation for their business to capture that value. So an example would be you're building out all this capacity and you've got media companies over the top providers riding on top of that, um, utilizing the network to deliver value on their business model to their customer and you're maybe not capturing it. So, but as these networks again, become more agile, flexible, software driven, it opens up an, an entirely new set of opportunities for any telecommunications provider to again, capture that value, right? And, and monetize the investments that they're putting out into the network. This episode is brought to you by Five9. Power more personalized interactions with real-time data to create extraordinary customer connections. Streamline the agent workflow experience with Five9 and revel in the results. Gentlemen, I like, Many industries, you know, part of what service providers have to do is, you know, attract customers and retain those customers over time. And Greg, I'm curious from your point of view, you know, how are service providers really using some of these new digital techniques around experience design, you know, some of the transformative things we spoke of to help with that process, or is it creating threats to that process of attracting and retaining? What's your take on that? Well, let me come at it from, well, let me come at it like this. If you think about the type of people that lived and worked in a service provider 20 years ago, right? You had network engineers, you had people doing physical installation of technology, you had all the basic organizations you can imagine, marketing and accounting and beyond. Well, now look at these organizations. You've got thousands of software developers running around, right? You've got onshore, offshore. I mean, they are building software applications 
to span every facet of their business, whether Charlie mentioned was retail, subscriber experience. Um, one area that, that you maybe don't think a lot about unless you're in the business is next time you walk into a big arena or a stadium, like, like think about that. Like think about the capacity that has to be there to connect all those different subscribers. Well, there's 99% of the time, there's a service provider working with that stadium to enable things like fan experience right behind there. Well, those provide point in time opportunities then to promote yourself right, and your services uh, to a, a new potential subscriber base. So Charlie, anything you, you'd add on top of that? Yeah, Greg. So, you know, I think there's a lot of examples here, but in the, in the classic, you know, service provider telecom space, we've watched digital innovation bring all types of new capabilities for both retail and business consumers. And as we think about that, it's, it's, thinking about how they've transformed what type of services and offerings that they want to provide to the household or to the resident or to the, the commercial business, hotspots in the home that are competing directly for connectivity in the home, right? So we're watching telcos really bring connectivity solutions beyond the phone. We're watching it happen in other areas around security systems and platforms that they're deploying to better enable smart home or automation. So what we're really watching is not just them provide better guest experience as a, a phone or a service customer in traditional ways, it's the new services that they're bringing to the market that are enabling these generalize better digital experiences for their for their guests for their customers for their residential you know friends and families and so as they do that there's a lot of innovation happening of new expansion services products and even new hardware that they're bringing to market as well to to really you know keep these customers um, entrenched in a, a great digital experience mm -hmm. yeah matt i might add one thing on to that too i mean think of Think of how you just think how you watch TV or watch any sort of video these days, right? That used to be a sit down experience, right? And, and for those of us of a certain generation in front of a box, right? But, but now think about that. I mean, I'm probably watching as much on my phone or a tablet or anywhere else. And I'm going to pause at home and I'm going to pick it up at the airport. Um, this was something that was, I think, talked about in an aspirational way for a long time in the communications industry. And yet now it's here, right? And it's evolving. And then look how somebody who's 15 to 20 years old interacts with media. All of that has to ride on a network, a very, very robust network. Uh, so there, there's a lot that goes into it, but it's also delivering value right, to ourselves as, as clients and subscribers in a very different way than it did even, even just 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, Matt, before we move on, sorry, I'll add one more thing just because uh, it, it hit me, but as Greg talks about the services being provided over mobile, we're also watching a tremendous trend specifically in our space around mobile gaming, right? People are moving away from gaming consoles and traditional methods and, and playing whatever device or playing on whatever device they have near them. And so we're watching these needs for ultra low latency, real time connectivity and collaboration at the edge in ways that we hadn't seen, right? They'd always been hardwired through our homes, through consoles. And so we're watching mobile gaming drive whole new sets of experiences, not just in the gameplay, but for these carriers and for these service providers and the offerings that they're, that they're bringing to market. And, and some service providers are even starting to think about offering preferred tierings or extra low latency offerings specifically for things like gaming or metaverse or even in-home video conferencing needs of ultra high bandwidth. So we're watching them develop a lot of new services and capabilities to really match this mobility craze that, uh, the, the, that we all play in. Yeah. Well, I mean, Greg, I'm watching uh, TV in a window right here on my iPad right now while I'm talking to you while I'm browsing for Fortnite skins. Well, like, no, nah, I mean, I'm not really doing that, <laughs> right? But I could be doing that because um, we're all sort of multitasking and have those assets around us at any time. And I get that service providers 
are a key player in providing that capability to us, which I very much appreciate. Um, well, so my next question for you is, uh, you know, thinking about like the investments that these organizations make. In some cases, they're very significant investments. And so what are the considerations they have in mind or they keep in mind while they make these sorts of investments around digital transformation and that future state we're looking for? So Matt, the great question and the concept of future proof and future proof investments is a bit of a false narrative when you really think about it. It's hard to predict, particularly in the last year and a half with the dawn of generative AI, where this is all gonna be 12 months, 24 months, and, and even further down the road. But you've heard the expression that if, if you wanna get an idea of where it's going, you know, watch your kids, watch your nieces and nephews and see how they're interacting with media. It's fascinating and it's changing very quickly. So you know, back to answer the question, in, in the service provider communications business 20 years ago, it was I'm gonna build a network and I need more capacity and I'm gonna build a bigger network and I'm just gonna keep adding capacity to it. And that went on for a very, very long period of time, billions and tens and hundreds of billions of dollars in capital invested. And yet now it is, I need to build and operate a big network, but it's gonna be software defined. Right? And I'm going to use software, I'm going to decentralize every aspect of it that I possibly can because I need it to be agile. I need it to be agile to deliver on the promise of the services we deliver today to our subscriber base. But then furthermore, right, they're going to be seeing some things emerge and I have to be relevant in the future and I have to be flexible and be able to, to adjust the, the type of network, the type of delivery models very, very quickly. Yeah. I I, I generally agree, Greg. I, I'm, you know, most of the discussions are around openness of systems and platforms. You said software defined. I think that's a great way to think about it. We talked about Matt, how many you know software developers these service providers now have. I, I think most of the discussions we're in are around trying uh, the service providers trying to retain uh, remain somewhat independent of technology platforms. Um, not that they don't have their favorite partners and vendors and they always will, but they're having to, to make sure that those partners and vendors are have openness in their systems. They can move data in and out freely. They can build on top of it. They can extend these platforms easier than they could in the past. There are a lot of closed ecosystems in the telco space and the service provider space. And what we're seeing is them you know, requesting and demanding that those become more open and have more interchangeable parts. Um, they're not just buying single vendor, sole vendor, locked in, full stack. Uh, they're, they're building more heter heterogeneous ecosystems. We're watching it, Matt, in our own labs and ATC, you know, capabilities where they're bringing in these technologies and bolting multiple things together to see how they can optimize things. And can those tools exchange data seamlessly? And I don't just mean network data, but the metadata, all the information they need to operate. And so that open standards and really thinking through openness of their platform to give them flexibility is, is a huge part of, of how they're thinking about their investments. Yeah, Charlie, I'm always amazed at all the, you know, labs, proofs of concepts and so forth we're doing here at the Worldwide Technology Digital Van Technology Center, uh, the ATC as you referred to. And, and that's a great way to experiment with some of these things. And I know that we do that a lot with service provider clients to help them make the right uh, business decisions based on their, you know, for their technology investments. Um, well, Greg, I wanna come back to you for a second and ask you like, how are service providers measuring their business success these days? And how has that evolved a little bit as we talk about kind of digital and these uh, transformations that we've been discussing? So Matt, one of the, the, the big areas that we spend a lot of time with our customers thinking about is return on investment, return on capital, right? I've gotta build out this network, I've gotta operate it, I've gotta maintain it, and I have to expand it over time. Right? But as I'm putting glass into the ground, fiber, as I'm putting more capacity into my wireless towers, how am I capturing that in terms of new residential subscribers, in terms of passing more businesses and signing up more businesses and selling them security services and potential other services on top of that? So there, there are these, these finite set of metrics that have been around for a long, long time, right? Ability to require, to acquire customers, to retain customers, to reduce propensity to churn, things that those of us been around this industry talk about a lot. But, but we're hearing more and more now around customer delight, right? And, and competitive differentiation, right? 
And then there's there's even another wave. I mean, these networks operate, uh, the, we use them to operate our lives. So societal impact, right? How are we working to improve the position of not just our employees, but constituents in our community? This is a big deal. And I will applaud the SP industry for really uh, recognizing that early on. Charlie talked a little bit ago about making broadband for uh, uh, individuals that maybe didn't have access to it before. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Charlie, anything you'd, you'd want to add on top of that? You know, from a from a digital perspective, I think Greg and, and Matt, obviously subscriber growth, revenue growth, all, all the classics, but Greg touched briefly on churn. There's a lot of work being done around churn and trying to optimize and minimize churn. Um, we're doing a ton of work, Matt, in using both AI solutions and other things to investigate all the data across the ecosystem and life cycle that drives churn. So they're investing very heavily in technologies and solutions to really both as Greg said, drive better guest experiences, better, better, you know, uh, connectivity experiences, new experiences. But at the same time, they're investing significant amounts of money into understanding churn and understanding how to reduce that. And that's from contact center, retail store, um, failure rates on phone calls, all types of things. The data that they have available to analyze is massive. And so, Matt, we're starting to to see them with some really awesome AI solutions, start to really dive deep into that to drive those better experiences and to understand the impacts that their outages or their challenges are having on customer retention. Mm -hmm. Well, Charlie, I know that, you know, here at Worldwide Technology, we're doing a lot of different things with digital twins and you know, we're gonna have a whole show on that, but it's also my sense that, you know, we're using digital twins in a very specific way to help revol revolutionize network operations for service providers. So I wonder if, if you could speak to that and then Greg, of course you as well. You know, we, we probably could have started with the digital twin that would have taken the whole, the whole discussion, but no, from a right. digital twin perspective, there's, there's a ton there. I mean, we're working closely with our friends at NVIDIA and thinking about, <clears throat> you know, 5G tower placement and using uh, digital twins to drive aerial RAN solutions so that they can figure out, you know, what type of coverage and density and expectations that they have at different parts of the city or different parts of the market. Um, so there's digital twins around expansion or growth or new tech technology innovation that they're looking at. There's a ton of work on digital twins and thinking through how to provide a, a better network experience, reducing time of resolution or, you know, for outages or failures or issues digital twins to understand and emulate how software changes or firmware changes on the network could be deployed faster or with less risk. We're seeing them also think about digital twins, not just for internal consumption, but how can they provide connectivity solutions and edge, edge solutions that drive digital twins for industry 4.0, for robotics and automation solutions for their customers. So as you think about digital twins, it's, it's how can they use it to grow their business, expand their business? How can they operate more efficiently? How can they have better predictive or preventative maintenance? capabilities, but also how can they enable capabilities for digital twins for, for their customers as, as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, it's, it's amazing really, isn't it? If you think about it, that you, the, the concept of a digital twin, that you can build a digital instantiation of a network or data center, but it's not just a, a visual look at, at what your network looks like. It's then got the replicated data environment underneath it. So you can do bench testing in meantime to detect and respond. Charlie mentioned the power of, of what is possible and what will be possible around using AI uh, to run these networks. But you're not gonna go test that in a production environment. <laughs> you, you typically wanna test that in a non-production environment because if you're gonna break something, you wanna break it there or you wanna tune it and learn and evolve. And, and, and that harnessing that power of digital twins which is really not a thing, it's a category. It's a new category of technology, is incredible. And then you think about the processing, right? The, the, the data centers, the, the compute required to build and run these digital twins. Uh, it's a lot of infrastructure, right? And, and, and you're, you're wading into to deep water to do this. And this is where Charlie, the team, we're right in the middle of 
some really fascinating engagements with a lot of our, our largest clients. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, Matt, real quick on the back end of that, one of the things Greg said that's that I think is really important is it's not dis- just digital twins for simulation of something. Our customers are starting to operationalize these digital twins. They're starting to think about them almost like a development environment. If you've ever built software, you build it in a dev environment, you test it, and then you propagate it over to the production environment or the QA environment. And they're starting to bring the and weave these digital twins in as part of that approval life cycle of it, almost like a software development life cycle where you're moving it across environments. We're starting to watch customers really build out operational digital twins so that they can then take the exact replica of that twin and push it into production. And that's that's something that's significant. And as Greg said, it's it's intensive, it's massive, but boy, does it reduce risk and does it give them a lot of flexibility for testing scenarios that they just can't do in a physical world. Yeah, that's fascinating stuff. And just you know, for the audience tuning in, if you're interested in that, we've got a lot of information about digital twins of all kinds of forms. Uh, WWT.com, so I encourage you to check that out. All right, gentlemen, last question for you. As you're kind of looking ahead of the future of the next year, two years, five years out, thinking about digital, thinking about service provider, like what trends do you expect to see and uh, what are you excited, what are you looking forward to? Charlie, you want to hit that? Oh, gosh. There's so much, you know, I talked about mobility and and everybody has a device in their hand, but those devices are getting more and more powerful. I mean, you you know, even the big uh, uh, um, OEMs are are bringing AI into your hands and and your headsets. You know, I think that's a, a huge game changer. We've played with augmented reality at the edge. You've seen it in, you know, Google Maps and other things where you can look up and see where you are and see the city around you. I think that whole metaverse concept and or gaming concept or augmented reality concept is going to move more into the mobile devices that we we have in our pockets. So that's a, that's a big area of expansion and, uh, that, that I would expect, Matt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think I'd be remiss not to end with AI. Uh, it's just it's touching and going to change everything in terms of how the business works and the types of experience that, that you can provide to your end subscriber base. There are also other implications in terms of AI um, on, on the security front. How do you secure these networks more effectively? Uh, but clearly, it's not just a race to add more capacity. I think if you've heard a theme from us today, it's not just we're going to build bigger networks, we're going to run bigger networks. It's we're going to build agile networks that enable experiences to the, the residential subscriber base, wired, wireline, entertainment, all the way through to business services customers. And, and that is just going to continue to expand. I mean, you're always going to need a network. People don't always know how they're connecting into their phone and where the data goes and traverses networks in and out of data centers. They just care about the experience. But you're always going to need a very robust network set of networks um, to, 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 to run our lives, to run these businesses. So it's, it's an exciting time for sure. Yeah, totally agree. Definitely exciting time. And, uh, appreciate you guys spending some time with us today. So Greg, Charlie, thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Matt. Yeah. Good to see you again, Matt. Thank you. Yeah, you too. Hey, and thank you for joining us as well. Uh, this is one episode of a four part series we have on the telecommunications industry and how service providers are dealing with things like artificial intelligence, business agility and security, and of course, today's topic, digital. And you know, this is just one episode of lots of great content we have out on WWT.com. So if you enjoyed this, uh, we've got a back catalog you can watch on demand at any time. Plenty more coming up on the calendar. I encourage you to check out. And we always like to hear your feedback. So please uh, give us some results on that survey. Should you get it or just drop us an email, let us know how we did, reach out, and we'd love to hear from you. So with that, we'll wrap today's session. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.